I want to welcome you here today. It is a pleasure to see you once again. We're coming to the last part on the seven bowls. I believe it will be the last part. At least that's what I had said, but we talked about doing maybe one or two more. Uh, because the story is just so amazing. It, can, it, just, it cannot cease to amaze me how intense and how deep and how profound and how all the details of the Bible come together, all the loose ends and the knots come together and form this perfect matrix, this perfect story. Um, I guess uh, I want to welcome those that are watching us online. I don't know if I have done that already. Um, and I hope that you'll be blessed by this presentation that you're about to see. Amen. So we have come to <coughs> presentation 37, and we are here looking at a chart of the last six, 75 days of Earth's history, okay, right before the second coming. And here we have where mercy ends, right there on day 1260, Revelation 10, 7, and and then the, all the 144,000 will be killed by that day already. And they remain dead for three and a half days. And they, they ascend to heaven on day 1264th. Okay, so they ascend. And then the next day we have the seventh trumpet right there. And that is the closing, the official closing of mercy <clears throat> and the beginning of wrath. The moment that mercy ends, wrath begins. <clears throat> and right there, so you see how that 1265th day aligns with the first of the first bowl. <clears throat> Each of these bowls, I believe, this is not written on stones, but I believe each of them are 10 days long because we have 70 days and we have seven bowls. And God usually does everything on sevens. So very likely that seven days seven bowls, and it climax here, and it ends with the second coming on day 1,335. So, <clears throat> as you can see, we have the first bowl, which is painful, ugly, painful sores, right there, 10 days. Then we have the sea turned to blood, the second bowl. Then we have the rivers and the springs of water turned to blood. Then we have... Yes, right there. And then I'll come back and talk about this. Then we have the sun scorching people. Okay. And then we have darkness on the fifth bowl, which is blindness, I believe. Then we have the six bowls we're going to cover today. The river Euphrates dry up. And then we have a mighty earthquake and the second coming. So, as you can see, 1260th day right here, 1270, 80, 90. We have 30 days. And then we have the 1290 of Daniel. You see that? 1290 of Daniel 1211. And the abomination that causes desolation. So here we have, and I'm not going to have time to talk a whole lot about that, unfortunately, because of the time. So you can tell, it, it, the 1265 here, so 1275, 1285, in the middle of the third bowl, we have the 1290 days of Daniel begin. Okay, I believe that to be a, an attempt to annihilate, a third attempt. Uh, or, or I can say that when you turn on a fire, and you have like uh, 10, and then 20, and then 30, you're turning up the heat, that's what happens. The heat begins at the, at, 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 I don't have the full chart here, day one of the, when the sea beast arises, the heat begins, and then at the sixth trumpet, the heat is magnified tremendously because there's four demons that are kept ready for this very day and hour, Revelation 9, verse 15 and 16. And these demons they are allowed to kill one-third of the earth, just like the Lord's four angels were allowed to kill 25% of the world population. These four demons are allowed, with the imposing of the mark of the beast, they're allowed to kill one-third, which is exactly the same amount that died when the fourth seal broke. So, essentially, the same amount, 50% of the world population will perish before the second coming. So, <clears throat> so then here at the 1290, even though the, the saints are all sealed already, no one will die at that time. But there is an attempt to annihilate the people of God again 
And you can almost see why. You know, they have killed the blood, shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, so God gives them blood to drink. So they want more blood because they're so angry. Right in the middle of that plague, of third plague right there. Okay, and then um, you're going to see how he goes from here to here. That's five days, 1,295 days. And then another 10 days, so that's 15 days until day 1305. Day 1305, persecution comes to an end in an amazing way. And we're going to cover that today. And you will see how persecution comes to an end completely right there. But we're not going to spend so much time here because we've got to cover this and this. Amen? Let me get a little bit of water here. I apologize. All right. <clears throat> So, as I said, it appears I will be in, a, in a, an attempt to destroy God's people on the 1290th day, but they don't, do not succeed because Michael stands and delivers his people. And they're all sealed already. Um, okay, so, just as God protected, just as God protected the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, remember when the bad, you know, wicked people wanted to kill the two angels, the, the saints, I mean, there were angels. There were holy beings that were here. God threw a, a plague of darkness and a blindness of the wicked people, and they were not able to, got all confused. They were not able to kill and touch the saints. Well, God will do the same thing uh, at the fifth bowl, and this is precisely what ends the persecution. Okay? So, and I'm going to show you that. And which also... What, what is amazing, remember the, the 42 months of Revelation 13.5? The 42 months? Well, 42 months, we're talking about lunar months here. We're not talking about 30 days, months. A month is a moon, month, 29.53 days. So one, when you add it up, 1,240 days, which is exactly 1,240.3 days, which in inclusive counting is 1,241 days. And that persecution uh, ends also, that, that 42 months ends exactly on the day 1305, right here. Wait a second. Yes, oh, oh, I made a mistake here. This was supposed to be right here. See that right there? It was supposed to be here. I apologize. So it does not end over here. It ends on 13.05. So may, I'm going to make that correction. I apologize. So, and that, that 42 months, when you rewind back, it gives you 64 days for the first four trumpets to, to happen. Okay? And then the beast rises, and then you count 1,241 days, and it ends right here. I will not have the time to show you all that from the Bible. Uh, because we're not going to have the time to go into the fourth trumpet. Okay, but, uh, and I wanted to, but unfortunately, like I said, it's so complex. The story is so amazing. There's so many details involved that I told my wife, I said, I'm almost crying from sadness that I cannot share everything. It's just too many details. One has to sit down and spend hours and hours trying to study to absorb all the details. But we're going to do everything we can <clears throat> to show as much as we can today. Notice this confusion in the Bible. Uh, plague number five, this blindness, this darkness. Revelation 16, 10 and 11. The fifth angel poured out his bow on the throne of the beast. Notice that the bow only affects the throne of the beast. You know, the, the employees of Satan's theocracy. And his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnaw their tongues in agony. And curse the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. They refused to repent of what they had done. But the question is, what will cause this darkness? You know, if you recall, the fourth trumpet is also a plague of darkness. Remember that? One third of the earth, the middle third of the earth becomes dark, you know, where people live. And, um, and uh, given the physics and what we know about what we have observed historically about volcanoes, how uh, volcanoes, when the, you know they they go in into eruption and uh, eject and the soot fill the sky, it will darken because you can't see through 
you know, that kind of, that kind of ashes, volcanic ashes. And that will cause one third of the earth to go dark. But what is interesting is that you don't read anything about men biting their tongues or gnawing their tongues, you know, from pain, from darkness. But this, this plague is very different. They're biting their tongues. They're chewing their own tongues. They're desperate. That's like a pain that they can't even describe that kind of pain. And why are they doing this? How can we explain? You know, the question remains. What causes this darkness? There's only one answer that can possibly solve this whole this question. And we use uh, rule number three by looking at a parallel passage of the Bible and to see, to shed light into what this is saying. And so, the only thing in Scripture that resolves this question is a parallel from plan A. Uh, under plan A, God would inflict a similar plague on the wicked. But of course, plan A has been abandoned. You guys know about that already. And we are on plan B. And this is found in Zechariah 14, 12 and 13. Notice, this is the plague which the Lord will strike all the nations that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rotten while they're still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets. On that day, man will be stricken by the Lord with a great panic. Each man will seize the hand of one another and they will attack each other. So I believe this blindness on the fifth bowl is caused, you know, uh, caused on, on Babylon's leaders will be uh, similar to this plague that was supposed to happen under plan A that has been abandoned. Um, and this plague will be a punctiliar plague. It's going to be in a minute notice. Boom. You're good right now. All of a sudden it will strike. It will not be from consequences of sun or anything else. It will be stri they're going to be stricken by this plague. And I believe that they're going to be dark and, and blind and panic, just like we saw here. Um, and this plague will accomplish many things. This darkness uh, causes men to nod their tongues in pain. Because imagine if your eyes melted in your socks, sockets. You'll be, you don't even know what to do. You know, all the pain. You'll be chewing your, your tongue. You, you're desperate. And this darkness causes the 42 months of persecution to end. Because how can blind people persecute God's people? <laughs> you can't do that. You can't be persecuted by, by, by uh, blind people. Right? And this darkness causes the devil to be unmasked. I mean, by this time it's obvious that the devil is not their leader. It's not Jesus, who he says he is. Because... All this stuff that happens and the devil is powerless. Who the wicked think is Jesus. He is powerless to do anything about it. And now his character is 100% exposed. Everyone knows who he is. And finally this, this darkness causes Lucifer's theocracy to come to an end. To implode. No leaders. No one else to function. He comes to, he comes to an end. Now let me try to explain this on the chart briefly here. Um, as you can see, the sensor comes down, and you have the fourth seal breaks. One, two, three, four trumpets blast. 25% of the world perish right here. As you can see, from here to here, we have about 64 days. And then the sea beast rises. Remember, the beast has to rise after 1798. So the beast rises as a, as a man's response. What do we do? We know there's so much chaos on the earth. We need to inflict... God is angry with the world because of you know, sin, all the sin and all the, the immorality that the world is seeing today. And it's going, growing rapidly and rapidly. So Babylon rises right here, phase one. And then you begin counting 42 months of persecution. And he comes down... Wait a second, I had my little bowls right here, and they disappeared. <laughs> I had the bowls here, I promise you, but it disappeared. And as you can see, as you cannot see, but you believe me by faith. It <laughs> yes, it, it, you know, the 42 months end exactly 
exactly on the fifth bowl, in the beginning of the fifth bowl. Okay? Uh, I don't know what happened. <laughs> oh, it's totally a different slide. Okay. Yeah, see? Oh, wait a second. 890 day. Oh, okay. You know what? I didn't realize it. I did that. It's because I copied from a previous uh, presentation. So that's what happened. Now, there you go. So now you see that ends right on the middle. Thank you for that. Right on the middle of the first, I mean, the fifth, in the beginning of the fifth trumpet. So that's one, that's 10, about 40 days into it, it ends. The 1290 days is right in the middle of the third bowl. You have 15 days of, of, uh, of where we're going to be chased like wild animals. But to no avail, even if we're found, they're not going to be able to kill us. Right there. And right here, persecution ends. Okay? So, as I said, I will not have time to get into the fourth trumpet. Uh, not the fourth trumpet, but the sixth trumpet. I've been saying fourth, but it's the sixth trumpet. All right, so this is day 1305 right there of into the persecution where into the tribulation. The persecution ends on day 1305. All right. Now, we're, like I said, we're just scraping the surface here. All the details are amazing. Now, notice briefly again, so you can, if there's any doubt, 1290s, and then this was supposed to be right here. All right. Okay, so now let's move on to the sixth plague. All right, this is one of the deepest and most amazing of all seven bowls. The Bible says in Revelation 16, 12, and 13, The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophets. And they are spirits of demons performing reckless signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for that battle of the great day of, of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Bless is he who stays awake and keep his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and his and be shamefully exposed. Then they gather the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now, we just read a whole truck load here. Okay? A lot. And so, before we get too carried away, I want to rewind and come back to uh, the next verse again. You know, the verse that talks about the sixth angel, the first verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bow on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way from the kings of the east. This is very profound. Uh, the parallel language here is very obvious to a lot of you. And uh, we're, remember the story in Daniel 5.1, and I'm not going to take the whole time to tell this story. But you remember how King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles, and they were drinking wine together. And um, while Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring the golden and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the kings and his nobles and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. I'm just reading from the Bible. You think it's my words, huh? <laughs> but this is what the Bible says. And so they're there having the greatest time. And you know the story. And when, they're, when we're very drunk already... Then, suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plasters of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as he wrote, Daniel 5.5. 5. And the Bible says his face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking, Daniel 5.6. And... The king, of course, summoned all the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. Then he said to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tell me what he means will be clothed in purple and have a golden chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom, Daniel 5, 7. And no man could understand. All the people that he brought, all his wise men, could not understand the writings on the wall. But they said, Well, there's somebody here that can solve this problem. And you know his name. His name was Daniel. 
And Daniel pretty much told the king Belshazzar that because he had not humbled himself, as did his father Nebuchadnezzar, that he had been weighed on the scale and found wanted. He had reached, you know, his sin had filled a cup. And God was about to, to bring judgment upon this king. And uh, God was going, Daniel told them that God was going to take away his kingdom from him and give to another. But there was a big problem. Babylon was an incredible fortress. And you know, the, story, the history was the, one of the world's wonders of the, the ancient world. It was incredible. No one could touch it. The walls were impenetrable. You could not go through it. So how do you do it? Uh, here are some visuals that to help you illustrate. You know, it was very well watered. And it was protected by the river Euphrates. And, and the water was all around it. And I have some pictures here to show you how it was so beautiful. These were real pictures taken. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and you can see, you know, how amazing. If you were inside Babylon, you were safe. Because everything you needed, it was inside Bab the walls of Babylon. And, you know, you're protected. You got food. You have uh, water. And they open their gigantic gates and a ship, a cargo comes in through the gates and deliver the merchandise inside and you close it, no one can touch you. It's, it's an amazing place. Um, now, they, it is said that horses and chariots could ride on top of the walls. That's how big it, it was. No one could go through it. And uh, this is not a picture of uh, Babylon, but this is Ur, the city of Ur, which was on the same line a few hundred miles from Babylon. And it was also built by the bank of the river Euphrates. Uh, but you get the idea how it was. Um, so, yes, sir. New Jerusalem be as nice as Babylon? <laughs> better, better, much better. Yes, but the point is there, how would King Cyrus be able to take the city without scarcely a fight? Well, as you may already know, King Cyrus dried up the Euphrates River and diverted the waters, just as Isaiah, prophet, prophet Isaiah, had said he, said he would, you know, a hundred years before. You know, over a hundred years earlier, God had predicted concerning Babylon and the Euphrates, I will dry up the rivers, Isaiah 44, 27. So the Lord spoke about Cyrus, uh, the Lord spoke about, uh, also spoke about Cyrus who conquered Babylon. And notice how the Lord, how, what the Lord said about King Cyrus, which was a Persian king from Iran nowadays. Okay? So now notice what the Lord said about him. Isaiah 45, 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed. Wow. <laughs> wow. He's not even a Christian. But I've been telling you that God has his people all over the place without even knowing. His servant Nebuchadnezzar, now he's anointed pagan King Cyrus, um, but follows the Spirit. And so he said to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, wow, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates. That's talking about Babylon, they had two leaved gates, and the ones that were under the river. And the gates of Babylon shall not be shut for that king. And insertions in pink are mine. So the Lord also said, Isaiah 48, uh, 44, 28, Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, a pagan king. And I will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. Isn't that what King Cyrus said? The moment that he conquered he sent all the, the captives back and he says, let it be rebuilt. Let them rebuild their city. Let them rebuild their temple. Just like God said. And this is exactly 70 years after the time of captivity. 70 years that they did not keep the Sabbath holy of the land. 70 years in captivity to the day they left. Amen. Then Isaiah, yeah, let it be rebuilt. And the end of the temple, let its foundations be laid. Pretty amazing. Oh, wait a second. My, my antivirus that I don't have, that I don't like, is trying to 
do crazy things here. All right. So, so did you notice how God called King Cyrus his anointed and his shepherd? I find that's amazing. I'll tell you why in a minute. <clears throat> so King Cyrus was the one who gave the command to the exiles return, as I said. And now notice the accuracy of the details here. I think in like in three or four slides you will see some details. I will go before you. I Well, this is in Isaiah 45, 2 and 4, in case someone will listen to this in audio. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut down through bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness that Nebuchadnezzar had stolen. Riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. Wow. God is not a respecter of persons or religions. It's amazing. Uh, for the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow you a title of honor. Though you do not what? No. Wow. Isn't this amazing? I mean, it gives me goosebumps all over the place. You know, and it's so sad where people b believe that you got to say the name of Jesus with your mouth and if you don't, you're done. And, and a lot of people following the Holy Spirit have never heard about Jesus. And God says, you are my anointed, you are my servant, you are my shepherd. You, are, you have received a title of honor, though you do not know me. That's what some version says. You do not acknowledge me. Wow. It's, it's, it's amazing. It is amazing. Uh, so here, you know, I said to you how Nebuchadnezzar was called his servant. It's the same thing here with King Cyrus. All right, so no, now notice the details here. I, Isaiah 44, 5. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you, you have not acknowledged me. He's talking about Cyrus again. And then Isaiah 45, 13. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city, speaking of Jerusalem, and set my exiles free from the Babylonian captivity. Words in pink mine. But not for a price or reward, says the Lord Almighty. I mean, this is just mind-blowing that the Lord prophesied this a hundred years before it happened. And Isaiah prophesied with accuracy. It's, I mean, it's impossible for anyone to know these things unless the Lord reveal. It's, it's amazing. Um, now, why did God call Cyrus his shepherd and his anointed one? Well, in speaking of Cyrus, the Bible says in Isaiah 46, 11, From the east I summon a bird of prey from a far off land, a man to fulfill what? My purpose. So where is he summon him? And you look in the map, Babylon, uh, Iran is on the east of Babylon, just like where he came from. And what I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. Okay, so King Cyrus came from the east. And he completely destroyed Babylon by drying up the waters in the river Euphrates and removing the natural barrier that kept them protected. You know, in fact, I, I, I don't have time to get into it, but Babylon, Jerusalem was also protected. Because, you know, from this river Euphrates because uh, the waters, the ice on the mountains would melt and would flood the rivers of Euphrates and would create a barrier between the kings that were trying to, the, you know, the praying kings that were trying to take weaker, weaker nations and protect Jerusalem. But that's a whole different story. Um, now, with this background in mind, uh, so the king from the east dried up the river Euphrates and removed the barriers of protection that, that stopped you know, them from invading uh, uh, Babylon. And now, with this background in mind, let's read the sixth bowl once again. <clears throat> Revelation 16, 12, 13. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was what? To prepare the way for the kings from the east. Now, keep in mind that this happens on day 1315 
inch at a time of trouble. That's 20 days before the glorious and amazing and dreadful coming of Jesus. Okay? Um, now, so who are the kings from the east in this passage that is getting ready to come? Anybody want to guess? Well, let's look for it in the Bible. You don't, you're not in a guessing mood today. For as a lightning that comes from the what? The east is visible. Even into the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will be gathered. Remember this for later. Okay? So King Cyrus was a type of Jesus. That's why he was called the anointed and the shepherd and the, the chosen one. He served a purpose for God. He's a type of Christ. You see that, right? Mm -hmm. And he also came from the east, dried up the waters of the river Euphrates, and did what God had accomplished for him to do. Well, the waters here, I don't have time to get into it, is persecution. The, the waters at, at the sixth trumpet, four angels that have been bound for this very day, hours, were prepared, and they came from the river Euphrates. Heat was turned up again. Persecution. Horrible. But here, persecution comes to an end. The waters dry out. The, the, the resistance that it's taken out of the way to prepare the way for the kings of the east. And the kings of the east will come and make justice, destroy sin and sinners, and put an end into this pain and this horrible world. And there is nothing anyone can do it because the natural barrier has been taken down. Hallelujah. That is beautiful. Now, the six bowl, the six bowl, but wait a second. The six bowl says kings of the east. I know the valor is all over that already because she is detail oriented. Praise the Lord. That's what I like. <laughs> and so it doesn't really match because Jesus is only one. How can it be says kings, right? That's weird, right? Well, let's talk about that for a second. Okay? Uh, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Is this a good description of the second coming? Is it a biblical description of the second coming? It is? Who says it is? Lift your hand. Oh, one person. Two. Mela thinks it's a... Okay, three, four, five. Okay. All right. Well, this... Uh, how, about, how about this one here? Is this a, is a good description of the second coming? Anybody thinks? Yeah? Let me see. Mela thinks. Lisa thinks. All right. Valerie. Okay. Well, uh, let's look at another one here. Okay, uh, this one here, and wait a second, I think I skipped one. Now, look at this one here. Uh, the people look like they just, they're coming from vacation, look. You know, he's got his scarf, he's all clean, he's going through nothing, I mean, he's got a good time, just came back from a cruise on vacation. Oh, Jesus, hello, Jesus. <laughs> I am so happy to see you, Jesus. It was about time, you know, my cruise was kind of bored, <laughs> boring. <laughs> well... Now, I mean, this is the kind of ideas that we have, you know, about the second coming. Where we're just here, all of a sudden, oh, there's Jesus, wow! <laughs> well, you know, so, yeah, I mean, this is the kind of pictures that we see. But, these are not accurate pictures of the second coming. Not at all! You know, the people of God will be chased like like wild animals and they're going to be running up the hills and they'll be scorched by the sun and we'll be a little thirst and some hunger. They're not going to look. They just came out of a, a cruise. <laughs> and now, now watch this. No, but that was tricky because it describes Christ and his angels. So yes. what we're saying, yes, yes. Christ. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, it's not biblical yet. And I'm going to prove it to you from the Bible. This is a picture here. I could not find a biblical picture because the artist could not understand the second coming. So I had to make my own picture. At the end, I'm going to show you. Now, so now, this is what the Bible says. Matthew 26, 64. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to you, to all of you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus is not coming alone. The picture has deceived you. <laughs> I thought I'd show you because a lot of people don't know that. They think that Jesus is coming as a solo. That's not going to be the case. Amen? I like I said, I searched and I searched. I could not find a right, the right picture. 
Um, all right, now let's get back into the story. Okay, the sixth angel, Revelation sixteen twelve. The sixth angel poured out his bow in the great river Euphrates, and its waters was dried up to prepare the way of the kings of the east. Okay, so when the sixth bow occurs, um, Satan will get very. Wait, did I not? Sh I cannot believe it. Let me see something. Did I forget to put a a picture here? Close your eyes for a second. <laughs> Oh, no, I did not forget. I'm going to show you that. Thank God I, I didn't forget. All right. So when the sixth trumpet occurs, Satan will get very alarmed. Okay? At, right at the sixth trumpet, he, he knows. He's going to get very alarmed and very scared. And then what is it? He's going to move to his final and last attempt to annihilate. But this time, since they already gave up annihilating God's people, they're going to try to annihilate Christ and His angels. Okay, I'm going to show you that. <clears throat> now, notice, Daniel 11:44, speaking of the Antichrist, Satan, person, you know, personify as God, looking like God, but reports from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. <clears throat> so, you already know what the reports from the East are, right? Jesus. Yeah, He comes from the East. Revelation uh, 7, 2. You know, he, Jesus came to seal the 144,000. comes from the East. It has nothing to do with, with the East, to be honest. It has to do with that anything coming from the, the, the... Because of the rotation of the Sun and the Earth, though anything that comes from space appears to come from the East. Okay, it's not that He lives on the East. I believe he's on the north. Well, that's what the Bible says. Anyways, now, now what about the reports from the north? What does that mean? Okay, I mean, it doesn't, say, it doesn't say only the east. It says, but reports also from the east and the north will alarm Satan. And he will set out in a great rage. He heard reports. Something has happened on the east. Something has happened on the north. Well, he heard the, the word already. Jesus Christ is coming. Now he's desperate. He doesn't know what else to do. He needs to set out in one more attempt to annihilate and destroy. But now, let's turn... I mean, so, as I said, we already know what the East... Now, like, what is this thing on the North? Where we get the answer, we've got to turn to the Bible. Amen? Where else can we turn to but the Bible? Job 37, 22... Out of the north he comes in golden splendor. God comes in awesome majesty. Amen. Don't you just love the Bible? Oh, yes. Don't you just think it's just amazing how all these details can come together and fit so perfectly? It's just unbelievable. I mean, this is like the cherry on the cake. It's amazing. Um, the Bible is so amazing. Now, by this time, Satan receives reports from the east and from the north. And by this time, his identity has already been fully exposed. Everyone on earth already knows who he is. He is not walking around anymore thinking that he, fooling people that he is God on earth. They know that he is the old devil that inflicted uh, pain on the people and made them receive this crude tattoo. Okay? Now... He has lost all his political power. Remember, they want to burn him. They want to destroy him. The kings of the earth want to eat his flesh. They want to destroy him, Revelation 18. Okay? And now, so he has lost all his political support, but he does not give up so easily. Notice what happens. In despair, Satan himself goes forth to deceive the world's most powerful leaders and to convince them to rejoin because once they found out who he was, they, 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 they wanted to destroy him and eat his flesh and destroy Satan's theocracy. Read, read Revelation 18. And, and, and in an effort to... And so he's trying to convince the, ten, the, ten, the world's ten super uh, leaders to, to rejoin him in an effort to rage nuclear war against Jesus and his holy angels. You think this is crazy? I'm going to show you this. And amazingly... Even though the kings of the earth know very well who Satan is, after witnessing a display of supernatural miracles, once again they unite with Satan 
to rage war against Jesus. So together, Satan and the ten kings prepare to raid one final war against Jesus and his holy angels. Alright? Now, I'm going to show you this from the Bible now, okay? I know you're getting worried. <clears throat> Revelation 17, you've seen this before. 12 and 14, but i got to bring it back to your memory. Then the ten horns you saw are what? Ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom in A.D. 95 when this was written. These king, ten kings have not received a kingdom, but I believe they have a kingdom today. Because I believe we're so close. And, but for one hour, means one point in time. Save me from the hour of trial. Save me from the hour of death. Well, this is that time of hour. It's not a 60 minutes. It is the, a, a period, a, a, a punctiliar point in time. But at, for at one point in time, we'll receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose. They will give their power and authority to the beast or the lamb-like beast. Words in pink are mine. They will make war against the lamb. Look at that. Talking about Armageddon here already. These ten kings will make war. How do you make war? Nukes. Every kind of weapon you can. Submarines and nuclear. You make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because He is the Lord of kings and King of kings. And with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers that were killed and resurrected and taken to heaven on one day, on 1264th day, namely the 144,000. All right, this is what they're 144,000 here. Um, so this war in the Bible is called Armageddon. And uh, <clears throat> notice the six bow once again, and I'm going to read it into, into its entirety now, so you can see this. So the sixth angel poured out his bow, a reading from Revelation 16, 12 to 14. The sixth angel poured out his bow on the great river Euphrates, and its water dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous sights. And, and what do they do? They go out. Where? To talk to who? To the ten kings of the whole earth. To what? To gather them. To do what? To do a, a, a battle for the great day of the Lord Almighty. The reports from the north alarm Satan. And he knows that the only way for them to survive is to gather the kings and to destroy Jesus before he comes. So they, that's what the Revelation 17 is talking about. Now, so, so um, let's talk about these um, three evil spirits, okay? These are three demons that proceed forth from Satan himself. These are his most trusted, powerful demons. And the Bible says they look like frogs. And I believe that for two reasons. I believe the first is because of the repulsiveness, repulsiveness of a frog. And the second and most accurate is because a frog catches its prey by its tongue. And these demons, they go out to deceive and with their tongues. And they're talking to these kings to try to get them deceived once again, to regroup and rejoin, to make war. This is our only way to survive. All right? And they came out of the mouth of the dragon. Who is the dragon? Satan. Revelation 12, 9, Satan. Out of the mouth of the beast, who is the lamb-like beast? <coughs> Satan. And out of the mouth of the false prophet, Revelation 19, 19 and 20, who is the false prophet? Satan. Satan. So he is caricatured three times. The same person here, namely the same. Okay, because he plays different roles in the story of Revelation. So, the devil will send these demons that will proceed forth for himself... And they go out to the kings with a simple message. Okay? And once they get there, they perform these miraculous signs. And the, the kings are like, whoa. And it says, you have, you have the weapons. We have the work in, miracle work in power. And the message is this. The message is, is, Jesus Christ will appear in the sky in about 10 days. That's the message that will go to the kings. Jesus Christ will appear in the skies in about 10 days. Then, the three demons will warn the ten kings 
that their only hope for survival is to unite powers with Lucifer and his army so that together everyone can make war against Jesus when he gets close enough to the earth. Lucifer's miracle working demons will deceive the kings of the world with lying tongues and this will set the stage for a battle that will end and climax with the destruction of everyone having the mark of the beast. Now notice verse 16. After I drink a little water, I'm sorry. Ever since I had my surgery, my throat gets dried. I'll edit that out. <clears throat> now notice verse 16. Revelation 16. Then, then, they, who are talking about, who are they here? The three demons. This is a continuation. Then the three demons gathered the kings together. They succeeded. They succeeded. They, they, they gathered them together. Okay? To the place that is in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Okay? Um, the word Armageddon, it's a compound word. It's a combination of two words. Uh, literally translated, the word Ar means mountain. And Mageddon refers to Megiddo. It's a plain, a valley. Uh, not too far from Jerusalem, in between the sea and the Holy Mountain, where, which the Holy Mountain is a term for Jerusalem. And uh, so it's a plain where King, um, uh, what's his name? Ahaziah. Ahaziah, yes, and Josiah died. Now, a lot of people wonder, is this a literal place or not? Well, I need an hour to answer that question, if you guys want to know. But we don't have the time today. So I'm not even going to touch that. No, I'm not going to even touch that because it's just so much. Okay? Uh, but I could show you, I can share what I, what I think. Uh, it's, 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 it could go either way, but I'm not going to go there today. Um, we'll talk about that some other time. So, we're not going to have time to go into it. I was going to, but I realized I wrote here, no time. But now, for now, let's focus on this war called Armageddon. Okay, let me briefly rephrase what we have learned so far about this war so we can all be on the same page. <clears throat> so, at the sixth bowl, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the ways of the king of the east, Jesus and the Father. Now, Satan was alarmed, Daniel eleven forty four. He was alarmed with the reports from the east and from the north. That's where the directions that God, that Jesus will come. Job uh, 37, 22, and, and Matthew 24. And, and then he started his final campaign against God. Then Satan, he dispatched three most powerful miracle working demons to deceive the ten most powerful world leaders, the ones we read in Revelation 17 and in Revelation 16, and to gather them to make war against Jesus and his angels when they, when they got close enough to earth. Now, and these powerful demons, they succeeded in their mission. And once again, I show you, look, they gathered the kings together. They accomplished it. They were able to do what the mission they were supposed to do. It's amazing that after knowing, fully knowing, fully being aware who Satan is, yeah. and these people all have this nasty tattoo that was imposed to them by Satan, and now they still join forces with Satan, knowingly. Defiantly. What choice do they have at this point? That's right. They're, they don't have any choice. I mean, either we're going to try to destroy this Jesus, you know, with his holy angels, or we're, we're doomed. There's nothing else they can do. So, there, you know, but there's a very important point here. See, the fact that the kings will agree to join with the devil, who has been fully exposed already as the devil, to make war on Jesus, it is the clearest evidence of the repulsiveness of sin. In order to save themselves and spare their own skin, sinners are willing to make war and kill their own creator. Yeah. Wow. This is, this is nasty. This is nasty. And, and, and that's every one of us here, folks. Every one of us, we have that capacity in us if we don't have the Holy Spirit in us. Amen. It's not just them, it's us. Amen. Okay? And this is a terrible, cruel situation that we can potentially find ourselves in if we continue to reject the Holy Spirit's guidance. You know, we're no better than the wicked if we don't have the Holy Spirit, if we don't have Jesus. Amen?
Now, please consider the condition of the wicked, uh, of the wicked, uh, the wicked kings during the sixth bowl. Okay, notice. <clears throat> so, they once, you know, the kings, the ten kings, they once were confident and loyal to Lucifer, but now they see that their loyalty was misdirected and their confidence misplaced. They realize that. They were once part of a powerful world government, but now they are powerless and broken. They were deceived, and after their eyes are open, they will realize that there is no chance of survival other than knowingly reunite with the devil. And like you said, there's the only chance they have. So, the wicked will look around on earth and see that everything is dead or dying. They still suffer from the boils. The oceans are dead. The springs of water are poisoned. The heat is unbearable. The great Savior turns out to be the devil himself. The ones that they follow. The, the planet they call home has been ruined. Remember, God is going to come to, to, to destroy those who destroy the earth. The Bible says, Revelation 15, it is as hostile to life as sin is to happiness. Okay? So now, the kings were a crude tattoo imposed on them by their demonic leader, yet they continue to impose a God, uh, to oppose a God of love, the, their creator, who is the creator of heaven and earth, because their hearts have been hardened by, rebel by the rebellion and hatred. They will voluntarily unite with Lucifer in an effort to destroy Jesus when he appears. This is the delusion and curse of sin. This is, this is nothing can describe how terrible this is. Now the Bible says that as the wicked are gathered to make war, this, this gets even better, as the wicked are gathered now, remember Revelation 16, 16, they're gathered to make war, then bowl number seven is poured out, and they're in place already, and the seven angel poured out his bow into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake uh, that, you know, it destroyed Babylon. I'm going to read that later. It split it in three. Now, about eight days passes from the time the, the, the last bowl, the seven bowl breaks, we know, 10 days each. Now, 8 days, 2 days before the 13th, 35th day. So, on day 13, this is day uh, 1333, okay, uh, they're picking up the pieces of this earthquake and everything. And on day 1334, from the sky, on day 1334, from the sky, a small sign appeared at a distance. A small sign appears at a distance. It is Jesus and His host of angels. And at that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now, they see this sign, and they're, they're tormented. They're getting ready for this battle. And then John, the revelator, John the Revelator also saw this very wonderful scene that Matthew recorded in Matthew as well. And he saw and he describes it in these words. Then John says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the Word of God. And then the Bible goes on to say, Revelation 19, 14 and 16, The armies of heaven were following him, riding on the white horses and dressed in white and fine linen and white and clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, which is a command, words are mine, with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will tread the winepress of the fear of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then the Bible goes on, Revelation 19, verse 17 and 18. And I saw standing in the sun, uh, and I saw an angel 
standing in the sun, who cried out in a loud voice to all the vultures. Remember the vultures in, that I told you, remember the vultures? Matthew 15, that they were gorging on the men. And all the birds of the air, and the eagles too, come together, come gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and generals and mighty men and horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave and small and great. And Revelation 19, verse 19 and 21 says, And then I saw the beast, this is talking about the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider. Remember the word, the Armageddon war. And the rider on the horses and his army. So they're, they were in place in Revelation 16, 16. And now they're ready to make that war. And they're pointing up their stuff to heaven. And their nukes and their, their nuclear weaponry and all that stuff. But the beast was captured. At a command, at a moment notice, Jesus sends his powerful angels and they capture, come and they capture Satan. And with him the false prophet, okay, this is the, the composite beast, with the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who have received the mark of the beast and <clears throat> the mark of the beast and worship his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the burning sulfur. So you, you see, they were captured. And I believe that Jesus will give a command and many brilliant angels suddenly descend from the sky and they will capture Lucifer and that beast and throw them alive into the lake of fire. Now notice how there is a lake of fire at the second coming. You may not know this before. You thought the lake of fire was only at the second, after the thousand years. No, there is a lake of fire that burns. And I will, don't have the time to show you now, but I believe the sea will become the lake of fire. The sea will be ignited with all the nasty dry fish that are floating and all the heat and all the, the burning hails that are going to fall ignites the, that sea and God keeps that burning until the, after the thousand years. But I, there's more scripture for that, but we don't have time. So, <clears throat> so, so then uh, Satan is destroyed and thrown in there. Okay? Now, I'm going to come back and talk about this in a second. Now, now look at this right here. Revelation 19.21 The rest of the dead, the rest of them, the wicked, were killed with a sword or the command they came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Um, also, Revelation 16.19.21 The great city split in three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed, and God remembered Babylon the great, and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fear of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. From the sky huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon the men, and they cursed God on account of the plagues of hail, because the, the plagues were so terrible. All right. Now, I want to say something here before I jump too far. Uh, I may have the notes here, but I, I don't know if I do, because I did not have time to go over this presentation again. I just wrote it and came and finished and came right before I came here. Uh, but the point is this. You may be wondering, wait a second, I thought Satan is destroyed at the end, after the thousand years. Right? That doesn't, doesn't make no sense. Well, you may remember that at the fifth trumpet, he comes out of the abyss. Right now he's in a state of you know, right now, he's in the abyss, in the state of spirit, spiritual realm. When he comes out of the abyss, what does he receive? A material body. Him and his angels. They're visible. They can be seen now. They can be touched. That is the body that is destroyed at the second coming. Their body, their, their body, their carnal body that they receive is destroyed. It's burned. That's why the next chapter, Satan, an angel comes from the sky and it puts a chain on them and sent into the abyss again. You cannot go into the abyss if you're, unless you're out of the abyss. He comes out in Revelation 9, 1, and receives a body. Now the body is destroyed, but he's a spirit. He doesn't get killed by that kind of stuff, by fire. So he's, once again, go back into the abyss for another thousand years, where he will stay here in a state of bodilessness without anybody, without anybody, physically, literally body, and anybody to tempt. <laughs> Nobody at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Um, yeah, I didn't think about that. It just came out. <clears throat> so, so that is what that means. You know, it is not that he gets killed twice. No. The story is amazing. I'm telling you. <clears throat> when you let the whole Bible speak and you don't throw anything away and you let it be guided by the rules, it's just phenomenal. Now, you may be wondering about Babylon. So, Jesus will divide the great empire of Babylon in three segments for punishment. He punishes everyone accordingly. First, Jesus will destroy Lucifer's throne and authority by casting him and his angel into the lake of fire. That is, Lucifer and his angels will lose the physical bodies. Oh, here, I made the notes, but I got ahead of myself because I thought I forgot. So, they'll lose their bodies given to them at the fifth trumpet. Jesus will strip them of their physical bodies and return them to the abyss for a thousand years. Next, Second, Jesus will throw Lucifer's government, that is, the employees and officials of the his theocracy, the ones that are blind, into the lake of fire where they will perish. Finally, Jesus will destroy all the citizens of the world who wear the tattoo 666 with the hot meteorites and with the command from his mouth. Babylon is divided in three parts so that each part can receive appropriate revenge. Or, or vengeance. I should have said vengeance. Okay? The Lord will righteful, righteful, righteous, righteously and completely dispense um, justice. He, he dispenses justly, justice accordingly. Vengeance. I should have said vengeance, not revenge. Okay? Now, why is Babylon split in three parts? You may recall, uh, you may recall how in Bible days, when, in, when a, 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 a conquering king conquered a nation, they would put the people on the ground and they would split them in three parts and they would, they would spare only one part and they would kill the other three parts. David did that several, several times in the Bible. Two parts, yes. They would cut two parts and spare one. Well, there is no one is spared here. It's divided in three parts and they're all destroyed. There's no sparing here because this is the wrath of God. Remember the trumpets, the redemptive trumpets. God does the opposite of the earthly kings. He only destroys one third and he spares two thirds. Well, then why bother to separate them? I'm sorry? Why bother to separate them into three parts if you're going to destroy all them? Because, because they each get a. That's a good question. That's a very good question. It's easier to whack them out that way. No, 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 no. That's a very good question because God does everything the, the way that, you know, if you've seen the other two parts or three parts so far. You see how God, you know, you shall be re rewarded according to your, to your yeah. works. So the ones that have done more will get the worst death. The ones not so bad will get to speak the spoken word and they, you know. But hitting by the meteorite is a little bit worse than the spoken words. You know, so that's a very good question. Thank you. That's why it's split in three parts. And there is no mercy there. All three parts are destroyed. Um, Yes, <clears throat> that's right. Meaning no mercy. Now, at, at that time, the saints will look up and say, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for Him and will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. And we will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. I put a minute. I had to make my own picture. Because I couldn't find. You know, the, they think that Jesus will come by Himself. But the Father is on the right side, the Bible says. <laughs> in Matthew 27, about 25, 64, or 26, 64. Yeah, he's on the right. He's on the right. F well, this is the right side, if you're looking this way. Yeah. He's on the right side of the Father. Jesus is on the right side. Correct. On the right side of the Father. Wow. Well, he can wait to see his children. He does not want to sit down. <laughs> now, <clears throat> you know, this is a living hope that every Christian, Christian should have uh, in their hearts daily. And then the Bible says, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and all the dead loved ones. Anybody here has a loved one that, that left? Will be reunited. And Jesus Christ and the and angels will call out the, the, the dead ones and bring them to you. I mean, I don't know that, but that's what the artists think and I agree with whoever made that picture. And will deliver the loved ones to their, to their folks. And then, oh, what a marvelous day that will be. And then the Bible says, 
Then, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them on the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall forever be with the Lord. Thessalonians 4, 17. This is the rapture. This is the real rapture here. I mean, isn't this amazing? And all the details and all this unbelievable story and all the details that the Bible has and like I said and I'm not even giving you half of the details because there's too many things too many details and how it all comes and it forms this amazing story that, I, that I'm telling you the story it's almost like a scripted story and it sounds almost like crazy if somebody tells you unless they show you in the Bible like I just did uh, but it, it, it's so descriptive it's just so fascinating amen now, if you believe this, I want to invite you today to stand up and sing with me as we uh, close this afternoon. Yeah? Stand up if you believe this in your heart and let's sing this together. <clears throat> and we're going to sing all four stanzas, okay? All right, let's do this. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing there will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sight. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory, we the thought of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what of great and rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon His beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. I want to say, I'm impressed to say that there's someone here today that needs to commit their lives to the Lord once again. They have been far from Him, I don't know how long. And God is calling you today to make that commitment. I don't want to look at anybody because I don't know who it is. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. But I believe that there's someone here that needs to recommit their lives and start walking with Jesus because they need to be ready when Jesus Christ comes and someone that is watching this video on DVD that Jesus is calling you also to make that commitment that you can see Jesus Christ and you can be ready and found ready and have your sins covered by the blood of Jesus when He comes. Amen? Amen. Anybody here wants to join me on that? Raise your hands. Amen. Alright, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You, Lord. We thank You so much for this amazing story that is the story of Revelation. Amen. Father, the story how a God will send His only Son to live among men and to live as a humble servant and to mingle with His creation and to give His own life to save them, to redeem us from the, from the, from the woe, from the sin. 
that we all have. It is an amazing story, Lord, and all this, and how are you going to be with your people throughout the whole time of trouble, and how all the details that we have been studying, Lord. Lord, we pray that this may be just the beginning of, uh, of an interest, to begin open your word and to begin studying it like we have never studied before, that you can reveal these details to us and get us ready and prepare us, Lord. I pray for the people that are here today that need to recommit their lives to you, the people that will be watching online through DVDs. I pray, Lord, that you bring us closer to you and to prepare us and cover us with your holy blood so that we can be ready and stand faultless, Lord, and sealed when you appear in the clouds of glory. It is our humble prayer in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.